This uh, Labor Day weekend, interestingly, uh, that's exactly what we're going to talk about, uh, God willing, today. We'll let, let the Lord speak. Um, so we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to read two sections in chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, and then 18 through 26. So again, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, and 18 through 26. Chapter 2, verse 4. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, for which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had homeborn slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. Skipping down to verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with him. This too is vanity and a great evil. For what does a man get in all his labor and in all his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days his task is painful and grievous. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? For to a person who is good in his sight, he is given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he is given the task of, collect, of gathering and collecting so that he may give it to the one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after when. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word this morning and consider these things written by the preacher, O oh Lord, we pray that you would enlighten our minds to understand what you have for us. These people didn't come here this morning to hear from me, O oh Lord God, and I don't even want to hear from me. I want to hear from you, O oh Lord. So preach to our hearts this morning. Help us to see our Savior in your words, O oh Lord God. Help us to see ourselves and our need for you, our deep-seated need for you to be able to enjoy anything in this life and have any hope for the life to come. Lord, be glorified in this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the title of the sermon is We Are Made for Works, and what we're going to look at today um, is how God has created us to do works and do works that are honoring to him. Um, as we look through the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher seems to go back and forth, almost reminiscent of his, his father David, uh, who would start out in much despair in many of his psalms, but then at the end come to a resolution that God is good and God is able and God is capable, and we see that uh, in the book of wisdom. Do I have a, I, I forgot the slide flipper, sorry. So ill prepared. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I knew there was something missing. So our outline is: we're going to look at uh, the introduction of the preacher. Who is the preacher, and why is he called that? We were made for labor. We were created to do work. We'll look at what that means. We'll also look at what the preacher means when he says vanity of vanities. And then we'll consider why we do work. Not just because we were made to do work, but why is that important? So let's start by looking at the preacher. 
The author of this, uh, the preacher, is uh, Solomon. He's the son of David. Um, he uh, reigned in Israel for about 40 years after, after David. And God, um, as, as we read in 2 Corinthians, God, God, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles, God gave him wisdom uh, beyond all of the kings of the earth, um, all the kings before him and all the kings that would come after him, uh, save one, and that would be the eternal king sitting on the throne of his father, David. So he had wisdom, he had power, he had wealth. And in the midst of having all these things, he sought to understand the way of life, why God um, created things the way that he created them, why he set up uh, for, for man to uh, do work. Uh, he sought to understand those things. And as he's going through, um, and, and labor is only one element of what uh, he considered. He considered pleasures and, and passions and possessions. He even considered wisdom versus folly. Uh, in his exposition, and I encourage you to, to go back. We only read a small section of Ecclesiastes. I encourage you to go back and read the, the whole book. Um, uh, as he considered these things, he said, all of this is nothing but vanity and chasing after wind, everything that man does under the sun. So the wisest man in all of, uh, in all of the world with all the wealth and all the power, uh, more wealth and power than, than, than anyone who had come before him, says, all of this is nothing but vanity. So the, um, the word, uh, the Hebrew word for Ecclesiastes or for preacher is uh, Koheleth. Um, it means preacher or one who, teacher or one who assembles uh, a group to be able to, to, to uh, teach them, to preach to them. Almost like bringing kids back to school. I guess school teachers are Koheleths. <laughs> And then uh, Ecclesiastes is the Latin form of that word, and um, that's uh, what the book is named after and from. Uh, Ecclesiastes in the Greek, we get the word ecclesia, which is called out, um, called out ones, which means the church. Just sharing this. And then the, the purpose behind Ecclesiastes from the preacher is to teach the people the meaning of life. So he's gathered the people together. And he's, uh, he's, he's trying to teach them uh, the, the meaning of life as he studied and considered all these different things. Well, as we said from the outset, uh, and what, what to attempt to, to bring us through uh, this morning is the idea that we were made for labor. How do we know that we were made for labor? Well, man is created in the likeness and the image of God who worked and is working, and we see that um, in Genesis, we talk about, talk, to, talk about God's work in creation in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. Uh, he goes on in Genesis, in Genesis 22, if you remember when Abraham was um, taking, uh, taking his son Isaac up on the hill to sacrifice him, and Isaac said, hey, where, where's, the, where's this sacrifice that, for the Lord? And Abraham says, God will provide. And we see that refrain throughout not just the Old Testament, the New Testament throughout our lives. God is a provider. In other words, he works throughout his creation to provide for his people. He's the sustainer of all things. God didn't just create and then just walk away from his creation, but he's intimately involved in every part of his creation. I think it's MacArthur who said, there's no maverick molecule in all the universe. In other words, God is paying attention and he's working in, in all things. Um, we see that God is in, it is, as uh, Paul points out in Philippians, it's God who is work, at work in, in, in us, and we'll come to that, back to that in a moment. And then we see that Christ is the author and the finisher or the protector of our faith. So in other words, he is the one who got it started. He is the one who will lead it to conclusion. God is working for us. Christ is working for us. He forever lives to make intercession for us. And from the very outset... God gave man work to do. We read in Genesis that God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So I don't, I don't know about you, but I never really consider what did, what did that mean when, God, when the Bible says God blessed them? What, what did God bless them with? Well, one of the things that we know that he blessed them with is the capacity 
to do what he has called them to do, the capacity to work. And not only, hey, not only the capacity to do it, but to do it and enjoy doing it. So he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, procreate, fill up the earth. Uh, we, we have a similar command to us. There's, there's an old, um, uh, I guess, blog, Steve, Steve, one of the original bloggers, an old uh, blog that Steve once shared on our website like 15 years ago or something like that, uh, where he, he talks about we are still under that same command to multiply. God's people, uh, not procre well, procreate us certainly, but, but then also to share the gospel of Christ with others, uh, to fill up the world from end to end with the good news of, of, of the Lord. So we are still called to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, uh, subdue it, uh, and, and rule over it. And when the Bible talks about um, ruling over or the dominion mandate, as it's called, God gave man not just the authority but the responsibility to take care of his creation. Now, I'm not, I'm not a, a green piecer or anything like that but by any uh, stretch of the imagination. However, we do have a responsibility given by God to care for uh, this earth, to care, even though it's broken, to care for the things that God has, has given us. Now, when God created these things, they were perfect. The land yielded up fruit for man as man planted stuff. If, if Adam planted something, you could, you could count on it to grow. It, could grow, it, it would grow wonderfully. Uh, it didn't have to chase down animals and kill them for food because at, the time, at that time, everyone was vegan. Tracy likes that. Um, <laughs> but there was, no, there was no fighting amongst the animals. The lamb laid down, the lion laid down with the lamb until things became broken. But... We see the external works of God in all his creation, his providence and redemption. And, and, and God created everything out of nothing, and he maintains everything, and he has redeemed everything, he, even uh, despite man's sin. He has said, hey, I'm redeeming all of uh, my people to myself, and re creation itself will be redeemed. So we are made for labor, even in a broken world, uh, the mandate does not go away for us to continue to work, to maintain, to care, to care for uh, the things that God has created. But the preacher, the wisest man who ever lived, said, "This is all vanity. We're all we're, we're all striving after win. There's, there's there's no reason why we should be doing this because." Um, it's, it's for nothing. We're going to wind up leaving behind all of our work to someone who comes after us, and they may be foolish, and they may not work, and they may not labor. Um, but let's look at a little bit more at what the preacher means when he says that. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's from Ecclesiastes at, at the opening, opening chapter. Um, the Hebrew word for vanity is hebel, and it means vapor or breath or emptiness or something that's unsatisfactory. I think I have up there. Yeah, so, and what he's saying is that, that regardless of what you do, um, regardless of how much effort, how much wisdom you apply to it, it's all going to either go away or you're going to go away and not get to enjoy it in its fullness. Let's turn over to Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, so right where we, almost same page where we left off. But three, uh, in chapter 3, we, we see the familiar verses uh, talking about a time for everything. But down in 311, um, 311 we read, He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has set, also set eternity in the heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. So, we are created to understand um, that we are, we, there, there's more beyond this life. Whether, whether we want to admit it or not, and there are you know, a lot of other religions, a lot of other folks out there that will tell you that when this life is over, it's over. So, carpe diem, live and get the most that you can out of life now. Well, it's not what the Bible teaches. There's a, there's a life to come, and so uh, we know that there's more. We're created with a sense that there is more than just what we have here. And so um, 
when we know that, it, 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 but we don't quite understand that, it leads to a, a bit of frustration. It leads to um, a bit of futility in what we go after. Um, the Greek word is metateos, and it means a futility or a, a, a void of truth. And it's the same word that, that Paul uses over in Romans. Look at Romans, uh, turn over to Romans 8. Chapter 8, verses 20 and 21 is actually here. So, for the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that creation itself also would be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, Paul uses the same word, uh, that the same word that, that, that Solomon uses, vanity, uh, uh, hebo, metateos, uh, basically signifying a futility, uh, a deceptive and disobedient futility. In other words, creation tells us that in, in, our, in our heart, in our deceptive hearts, we, we believe that our work, our effort, our toil will lead to some sort of satisfaction. I hate that I keep getting this going through my head, but it's, it's rolling stones. I can't get no satisfaction. But um, <laughs> tells us that, that, that we, can, we can work and toil and, and achieve a certain level of status that uh, we can be satisfied with it. And, and yet, there's something in us that, 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 that God has put in, in, in the hearts of every man that recognizes that there's nothing in this world that can satisfy because we see all of creation, I, I've heard this analogy used, we see all of creation through a, a, a keyhole. And we're not able to open the door because if we could open the door, we could understand and we could see all of God's plan and how that works out. But we only see a very, very small fraction and it's so unsatisfying to us. We don't see how our actions, how our words, how our deeds, how our work will affect someone else, will affect the world, will glorify God down the line. We, we, we can't see it. We can't, you know, all we can see is what God has allowed us to see. Even our best works here on earth, they basically wind up being, if you will, unfinished. The day that God calls each one of us home, um, you know, we will wonder, well, what happened with that? Well, what happened with this? I got a, I have an unsaved son, you know, and I pray for him every day. And God may call me home without ever seeing his salvation. So I feel unfinished in an earthly sense. But it's not unfinished. God finishes everything that he starts. And we may not always understand it in, in this life. So that's what, um, so, so that's what, the preacher is dealing with. He's dealing with the vanity, rec not recognizing, or again, it's kind of a dichotomy that, 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 that he presents. The foolish heart does not recognize that the work that we do, uh, for better or for worse, has larger consequences than besides just what we, what we recognize. Too far. skills. Ah, there we go. <laughs> and as we just read, he considered all his activities uh, uh, that his hands had, had done, the labor which he exerted, behold, all was vanity, striving after, wind, after the wind. There was no profit under the sun. So then, knowing that, let's look at why we work. And we've already talked about it a little bit, um, but there's numerous reasons why, why we do work, uh, numerous we, wise we, reasons why we work given from God, uh, but we're going to look at three specifically this morning. The first one, idleness is sin, and it leads to sin. We work to the benefit of others, and finally, we work to honor God. God who made the heaven and earth, uh, God, God doesn't 
need us to work. Let's get that straight from the get-go. Uh, God requires nothing from us to be satisfied, to be happy before he created uh, all of creation. He was joyful beyond our, he, our ability to, to, to understand for eternity past. He was extremely self-satisfied. God is the only one who can be self-satisfied. I know it seems arrogant, but he's God. So it's not arrogant, it's just true. So um, he doesn't need us to satisfy him. He doesn't need us to build, to create. In fact, the level of condescension of, 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 of the creator God is, is so great that he allows us to get in and, 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 and fumble with things knowing that we're going to screw them up. I've never done anything perfectly in my life. Definitely not the sermon. You're saying definitely not the sermon, but, but never done anything perfectly in, 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 in all of my life. Um, and yet God allows me and, and commands me to go and do. He allows me to take part in his creation and his plan for creation. That is condescension, condescension at, at the greatest um, we, we see over in Acts, Paul says, uh, when he's um, talking, to the, uh, uh, talking to the men in Athens, he says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. It is in him that we live and move and have our being. So... Um, so let's get that straight from the outset. We don't work because God needs us to work, um, but he allows us to work as part of his uh, great plan. So let's look at the sin of idleness. The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, uh, as we read in Proverbs, and, and, and the same author of, of, of Ecclesiastes who wrote Proverbs, you know, goes... Has, has numerous verses that talks about the sluggard. It talks about the lazy man laying on his bed and only turning from one side to the other uh, and, and talks about the death and destruction that comes from it. Um, so the desire of the sluggard puts him to death for his hands refuse to work. Laziness is, is, is perhaps the most insidious of sins because it doesn't require man to do anything. It's easy to sit on the couch and, 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 and do nothing. It's, it's easier to find ourselves snared and, and destroyed by idleness than, than probably any other sin. Because, again, we, 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 don't, we don't have to lift a finger to, to get after it. And the Bible warns time and time and time again against idleness. Um, you've heard an idle mind is a devil's workshop and idle hands is tools. It's, it's not written in the Bible. Uh, that's, that's not a quote from the Bible. However, Proverbs does tell us over and over again that whoever is slack in work is a brother to him who destroys. That's uh, Proverbs 18 and 9. Um, a good quote. Uh, we're helped uh, tremendously by, by uh, Associate Professor of New Testament at uh, Westminster um, theological Seminary, Brandon Crow. He says here, idleness is the handmaiden of temptation. Laziness often yields not only thorns for, from the untended gardens, uh, but temptation which leads to sin, yielding death. When we're focused on nothing or on ourselves, we are more prone to temptation that arise, temptations that arise out of our sinful hearts. Listen, we've said it time and time and time again. Our hearts are deceptively wicked. Paul says that. Paul, 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 this is, this is after conversion. Our hearts are still deceptively wicked. And if you give it to us, you give us enough time to sit around and, and, and do nothing and think about ourselves and think about our circumstances and bemoan this and, and cry over that, uh, we're, we're going to find that we, we fall deeper and deeper into more sin. Um, so... We, 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 the idleness of sin, uh, the, the, the sin of idleness, is, again, is one of the easiest to fall into. And, and that's why part of the reason why we're called to work. Moreover, Paul writes a letter, uh, uh, probably one of the uh, 
his favorite churches that he planted, if he had a favorite per se, uh, but one of the ones that, 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 that um, he, he exalts uh, quite a bit because they, they, they were humble in heart and receiving him and receiving the message and, and giving as much as they could uh, to, to, to be able to help, um, help the church back in Jerusalem was uh, Thessalonica. So in his second letter to Thessalonica, though, Paul addresses one thing, one, one, one big thing that's going on. And there were a lot of um, the saints in Thessalonica who had stopped working because they wanted to await Christ's return. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm quit my job. I'm, I'm not, not even going to worry about looking for another one. And remember, they, remember, pers- Christians were being persecuted at that time. They, it, was, it was already a, a little bit difficult for them to be able to work uh, because they were Christians, and there were, the, the surrounding community didn't necessarily want to, want to work with them. So it, it was difficult, but many of, uh, there, there were those among them who said, you know what, I'm going to stop working, and we have plenty of food over here when we get together for home fellowship and whatnot, so that's what, uh, I'm, I'm just going to join, join with the church uh, for home fellowships and not worry about contributing anything. And Paul disabuses them of that idea. He says over in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3, uh, 10 through 12, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Gets back to what we just talked about, right? When you, when you don't have anything else to do, you're, you're going to find something to do, and it's not going to be profitable. So acting like busybodies, now, such persons we commend and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Now, he's not talking about the, the, the widows and orphans and, and those who are unable to work. He's talking about the able body folks who are not willing to work. I'm not going to get into my, my diatribes about the guy standing on the corner saying, we'll save that for for another time, but, uh, but for those who are able to work, able to get after it um, and, and go and do something that's profitable and helpful, uh, they're called to, called to work and eat their own bread. In other words, not the bread of others, but, but, but bring something to the table. Let's look a little bit at uh, why we labor, how we labor to the benefit of others and and how we're called to do that. In Ephesus, Paul says, so I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walked in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from, lo- from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So in other words, we're a new creation. We're called to walk as new creations. As new creations in Christ, our priorities ought to not be building up ourselves or even, even, even get, trying to get to a point where we can stop working or so we can leave a legacy for our children or grandchildren, but so that we can do what God has called us to do and take care of those around us. Remember, one of the commands of, 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 of Jesus Christ was take care of the widows and orphans. Now, we don't, we don't see as many, uh, you know, it, it, orphans and, and whatnot as we saw, as, as they saw in their society. They had people who were literally living on the streets because if, if the um, man died in, in that society uh, and there was nothing left nor, than the women who were left behind, the widows who were left behind, the orphans who were left behind, uh, number one, they could easily be taken advantage of and have you know, what they had taken from them. And they could easily just be cast out and, and, and have nothing. So it was up to the church um, at that time uh, to, to take care of them. And, and Jesus said, make sure you're taking care of, of, of the widows and orphans. But we do have, well, we, we do have widows in our church. We, we, we do have uh, those who could use help, could use companionship, could use someone to care and take care of. And we're called to do that um, because we are new creations. Uh, we can't walk in the way that we had previously walked. And Paul goes on in Ephesians 4.28 to say, uh, describing this new creation, he who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, 
performing with his own hands what is good. And this is the reason why. So that he will have something to share with the one who has need. So that he will have something to share with the one who has need. So again, if you're able to work, the command is there. You are to work. So not again, not so that you can build up your fortune and, and, and my fortune and my fame. I'd, oh, I'd love to have, you know, multiple houses and fast cars and all this kind of stuff. But that's not why we're called to work. That's not why we're commanded to. We're commanded so that we can have something to share with those who have need. So part of uh, uh, the, the discussion with Steve when he said, hey, you preach Labor Day uh, weekend was uh, maybe we, we, we need to have a sermon about giving, about tithing. Uh, Bev will tell you, we, and we're no shame in it. We're, we're running about 200 bucks. Is it 200 bucks? R- r- about $200 or so behind uh, expenses versus I- income every month. Here, here at Grace for the past couple months. I mean, we have our highs or lows. There, and last year we were, and this year we, so, I mean, that's the that's the way it goes. But I did want to take this time to to, to encourage us um, uh, from the standpoint of making sure that we're taking care of need and making sure we're taking care of the needs of the church. And we've talked about this before. We hate this. Community Church, but I'm going to trot it out. Micah 3:10 commands us to bring our first fruits into the Lord's house, so that there may be food in His house. And the Lord goes so far to say that the failure to do so robs Him. Now, does God need anything from us? No, no. Does Grace Community Church? I, I tell you what. Thank God for Steve and and, and Anne Marie and the church plant. But the Lord planted the church. The Lord grew the church. They'll, they'll, they'll be the first people to tell you. The Lord grew the church. The Lord sustains the church. If it's the Lord's will that the church is going to be here, it doesn't matter how many checks we write, how many donations we make, um, then it's going to be here. By the same token, if the Lord says, hey, Grace is going to wrap it up in the next couple of years and we're going to shut the doors, then it doesn't matter how many checks we write, how many donations we make, it's not going to change anything. But as we talked about before, the Lord is so condescending that he gives us an opportunity to be a part of what he's doing here at Grace, not just with our service, not just showing up on Sunday morning, but also using the paycheck that we get from the work that we do to, to, to uh, put money into the, the, the maintenance of this church. Got a brother, I'm not going to call him out, but he, he, he actually struck me with something he told me about five or six years ago. Uh, he make, made, makes a, made a pretty good income, uh, had a pretty good amount of money rolling in, and we were talking about service in the church, being able to come and spend more time in the church. And he said, yeah, uh, but come to recognize that you know, spending time doing the work that I'm good at, the work that the Lord has blessed me to be able to do, um, allows me to be able to make an income and contribute to the ministry of the church. And there, there are many of us out here who are blessed with you know, significant amount of income to be able to contribute to the ministries that go on here at the church. Now, we only have one full-time person on staff, and that's our pastor. Uh, that's, a, that's been the way of Grace Community Church, so we don't have a whole lot of personnel money going out. We don't, we're, we're I think, what is it, Bev, like $600,000 is, is the remainder of the mortgage on the church, and so that's our big bill every month is the, the mortgage on the church, keeping the lights on, keeping the water flowing. That's where the majority of the money goes to. And, and we're still running about $200, uh, $200 a month short. Um, I would encourage you, be prayerful. Be prayerful about this. Um, God has invited us and given us the opportunity to participate in um, this worship. And giving is an act of worship. And be prayerful about... Uh, be prayerful about your giving. We've seen, we've seen giving, like I said, we've seen high. We've seen it drop off, you know, in, in the past several months. Uh, some folks who were giving just, and, and we're never going to, no elder, no, no one's ever going to approach you and say, hey, we noticed that, you've, uh, that you're not cutting the checks the way you used to. No, it, it ain't going to happen because, because we don't know what the Lord is working in your heart. And if you're giving, it has to be a, it has to be, it shouldn't be under a, a guilt or a compulsion. 
It should be because the Lord has put it on your heart. The Lord has revealed to your heart, hey, this is where I want my money to go. I'm going to belabor this point a little bit if I can. Um, my daughter, when we first, I, I talked about uh, uh, Joe Gilders leaving his home fellowship, and when we first started here, and we were having a service one night, and and uh, Stan had just led us in, in singing a song. I'm trading my sorrows. This is back in Agape, and uh, we were we were here one night and having fellowship and whatnot. And a couple of people got up here to praise. And somebody came back and said, "Chris, Sandra, your daughter's up there. She's like five or six years old, and she was standing not here but at Agape, and she was standing there. She said, and she was singing it solo. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord." Several years later, our daughter accepted Christ and was baptized. Um, a couple years ago, she was married right here in this church uh, and insisted on marrying a Christian guy because she was taught here in the church not to be unequally yoked. Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve um, did their marriage counseling prior to them being married and married them here in this church. Well, the guy who married, she married, great guy. I love, I love my son, Chris, son-in-law, Chris. Uh, um, said, oh, this is kind of your dad's church, and I, I wish we could kind of find a church of our own. And so they moved <laughs> to church right down the street. And, and some of you have heard me tell this story. And um, I'm talking to Chris about a month later, and I'm saying, so how's it going in a new church? Yeah, we find some place to serve and, and do all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm being discipled. I, I, I met a really great guy there, and he's really kind of discipling me in my my faith and said, what's, really, what's his name? He said, his name is uh, Andrew. It's, it's kind of hard to pronounce the last name. It's like N-G-O. It's like no. And, and oh, I'm like, he said, yeah, it's, it's like the folks who go to your church and lead worship sometimes. And I'm like, that's because it is the folks that go to our church. That's their son, you know. <laughs> and Andrew No used to play drums right up here as part of the praise team for many years. And yeah, it's sitting under the instruction of the word and then he carried that same spirit that same spirit of service instruction of the word out to another church so um i said all that to say this and, and actually i'm going to add one more to it <laughs> the young lady who bought me the clicker she was up here giving a testimony um last week uh, for those of you who don't know Paige, you got to meet Paige. Uh, but she was up here giving a testimony uh, last week because she had participated in EY2S and she had led a Bible study. And it, if, if you didn't know Paige before a couple of years ago, I would have, you'd be like, Paige? Because she led a Bible study and the Lord is just doing incredible things in that young lady. Well, that young lady came to the church because her brother started coming to the church. Her brother started coming to the church because his best friend in high school invited him to come to his church. His best friend was coming to the church because their parents brought him to the church from the time that he was like this. If you want to talk about, and, and, and it doesn't work this way, but I, I'm, I'm going to make it work this way. If you want to talk about return on investment, if you want to talk about return on investment, for everything, if I gave my entire paycheck to the church for the rest of my life, it would never, never come close to approximating the value of seeing my daughter baptized right here. And I remember when you were baptized, Paige, right here. I was the guy holding the towel. I didn't get to baptize anybody. I, I, get, I get to hold the towel back there behind the curtain, so... And the value of that, you want to, there's nothing, nothing out there that's going to compare to that return on investment. But here's the thing. But here's the other thing, though. It doesn't always work out like that. Like I said, we only see, we're looking through a keyhole. We could give all of our life, all of our ministry, all of uh, the warnings. Look at Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah got thrown in a cistern for all the work that he did, you know. We could, we could invest everything in his church and... We may not see anything. We may not see anybody come to Christ. We may not see anybody get excited about God. And that brings us to the third point, why we work. We work to honor God. 
The Lord commands us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work with us, as we looked at previously in Philippians, and he's at work in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. If you believe that he is Lord, if you believe that we are called to uh, out of our sin and darkness to, to, to serve him and to love him, then we should, that should be our primary motivation. That should be our desire, to will and to work for his good pleasure. And yet again, our hearts are deceptively wicked, so God is working in us so that we will will and work for his good pleasure. That's what it means to work out your salvation, by the way. It's not, it's, it's not a salvation bought by works. The, 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 the salvation has already been bought. It's already been paid for. Um, but it means to work, basically work through our sanctification, working these things out spiritually, working these things out physically. What are you doing? What are you doing with your time and treasure and talents? And are, are the things that you're doing, are they pleasing to God? Do they honor God? I think Jeff shared this last week. Whatever you do, do your work heartily for the Lord rather than for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the war reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. <laughs> Can't help but look at my sister Lily. We've we've been coming through. Uh, a, we work together. We've, we've been coming through a tough time the past couple months at, at work. Um, you know, customers demanding a lot of. A lot, a lot of work to get done. Um, we're coming to the end of the government fiscal year and the POM cycle. You know, anyone who's ever done that is probably just tipped over right now. But, but uh, coming, through, uh, coming through that makes for some long hours, and sometimes you just want to scream, but it doesn't honor God. When your employer sees you um, at work, does he think, wow, that person is excellent what they do. They show up on time. I can always rely on them. They show up on time. They do what they say they're going to do. They don't complain. They don't gripe. They don't moan. They get the work done better than anybody else I've ever seen. I wonder what's different between them and all the other employees. Is that the way your employer looks at you? Is that the way the, your co-workers look at you? Is that the way the, the staff, the teachers who are starting back to school, is that the way the rest of the staff at the public schools look at you? Are you working for man or are you working for God? And if you're working for God, it should be, it, we should work heartily. We should not, not just show up on time, but show up early to get after it, to be motivated to, 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 to go above and beyond so that the Lord is given honor. Even by those who don't know the Lord, the Lord is given honor because they know that there's something different about that believer when they come to work. Amen. And you may start thinking, well, we do all this, but again, I can't, I can't see past the little keyhole. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Whatever you do, whatever you do, trust that the Lord is going to take the things that you do, the things that you dedicate to him. When, you, when you, you're on your way to work in the morning, do you pray to the Lord? Or prior to going to work in the morning, do you pray to the Lord? Hey, Lord, use me today in my workplace for your glory. And then do you trust in the Lord that the Lord is going to use you in your workplace for his glory? Do you trust that the Lord is going to use what you take away from that workplace, you know, i.e. a salary, and, 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 and contribute it to the, I'll come out and say it, contribute it to part, part of it to Grace Community Church for uh, the preaching of the word and the upkeep of the church? Do you trust that the Lord is going to use that for his glory. Listen, I, we're, we're, not, we're not buying, buying planes for the pastor here. Um, 
we, we put the, the budget out on the wall right there by the bathroom. Go take a look. You can see what comes in, what goes out. If you want to see the full-blown budget, tell Bev, she'll email you a copy of it so you can see where the money is going. There's not, nobody's pocketing stuff. It's not, you know, our pastor's not, he's, he's richly paid in our love for him, but <laughs> he ain't richly paid in any other way. And, he, you know, but he'll, you'll never hear him complain. But I say, I say all that because we're, 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 we're trusting in the Lord, that the Lord is going to take what we bring in, and, and if we can pay off this mortgage and maybe bring on a pastor because our pastor's, you know, he's been at it a while, and we'd like to, you know, bring in a, a, a younger pastor, a younger man to, to, to train under him for a little while and, and, and be able to take the reins like Timothy did from, from Paul and, 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 you know, continue the ministry here at Grace. That's kind of our plan. That is our plan. But we can't do that. We can't afford a younger pastor right now because we're $200 a, and, and, and we have a $200 deficit every month. So that's where we stand. You know, are we worried about it? Absolutely not. Do we want to see God glorified here at Grace? Absolutely. Do we want to see all the members of Grace be part of glorifying God through the work of Grace? Absolutely. Do we trust in the Lord? Will we do good? Will we dwell in the land? Will we stay here and cultivate faithfulness? Will we grow that thing here? We talked about the line going back to uh, Mike and John Millette through his son, through uh, through his son's friend, through his son's friend's sister, you know, and then his son's friend's sister, the faithful couple, son's friend's sister, sharing the word and teaching the teaching Bible study at EY2S, and perhaps one of those little kids taking that word and, and carrying it out into her home, into her community, into her school, his or her school. You see how that works? And we'll never know. We'll never know the effect of Paige. Uh, hosting a Bible study, well, we, we, maybe we will, but we may never know the effect of page, you know, doing a Bible study at EY2S. But I guarantee you, it'll have an eternal effect. It'll have an eternal effect. You heard me tell, tell this story before, and I, am I over? I'm over. No, I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, <laughs> we were up at Bush Gardens uh, a couple years ago, and I was wearing an EY2S t-shirt, and a young lady was there working at Bush Gardens, and she had two of her coworkers with her, and she came over and she said, Mr. Jeff. And she's pointing at my T, EY2S t-shirt. She said, I, I'm, I'm part of uh, uh, Peninsula Community Chapel or something like that. And we, and we, we participated in EY2S ministries. By the way, that's a, there's a line item in, in, in Grace Community Church budget for EY2S ministries because we know the importance of that. Um, and she, she said, and, and I... I I participated in, 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 in the mission trip with UI2S Ministries, and she just goes on and on about how, you know, how the Lord just worked on her heart through this mission trip. She has her two co-workers standing there, and their jaws are on the floor. They're like, <laughs> and she's telling them about what God was doing. Yeah, well, she's telling us, but telling them about what God did on this mission trip through EY2S. So we know that. We, we know that God, we, we, got, we got a glimpse of, of, of what God is doing. But, but, man, we don't know the story. We don't know the whole story. We don't. But we have to trust in the Lord. And if we can humble ourselves, if we can, if, if, if we can stop looking at, hey, how is this going to benefit me? How is this going to encourage me? How, and, 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 and trust in the Lord. Then, we, then we, get to, we get to really actually honor God. Jeez, because to honor God is... Um, it's not just dronely going on in obedience, but it's trusting God. If you want to trust God, we, again, we can't bring anything to God. He doesn't need anything to, uh, from us, but we can trust him. You want to honor him, trust him. My heart's not proud. My eyes, oh Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. I, I'm, I'm not concerned about where what you're doing with, 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 with the meager little parts that I'm bringing in. But I've stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me, O Israel. Put your hope in the Lord. O people of God, put your hope in the Lord. O Grace Community Church, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever.
God bless you. Let's stand. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time uh, today, oh Lord God. Lord, as I always pray, I pray that you'd be honored, that you'd be glorified in uh, the preaching of your word, Lord. If there's anything that was said up here that's not from you, I pray that's quickly forgotten, oh Lord God. But I pray that um, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would unpack your will and your ways for us. Teach us to trust you. Teach us to chase hard after you. Teach us to work for your glory, Lord, whether it's in the workplace or in the community, in the home, uh, in, in, in the church, oh, Lord God, wherever we are. Um, uh, teach us to apply our time, treasure, and talents for your glory, oh, Lord God. Um, teach us to seek your face, oh, Lord. We can do nothing apart from you, and, and we certainly can enjoy nothing Apart from you, O oh Lord, it's all vanities if, uh, if we try to do it in our own strength and in our own understanding, O oh Lord God. But it's all joy. We count it all joy, O oh Lord God, when we can do it uh, in trusting in you. Lord, you are the Lord of our joy. Um, capture our hearts right now, O oh Lord God, and, 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 and take glory in, in all that your people do. Lord, watch over us as we leave this place, but never your presence. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you for old friends, Lord. So wonderful to see your faces. And thank you for uh, new friends. And, and Lord, we pray that uh, we would be bound together as one in you, one love for you, one love for one another, oh, Lord God, and to your glory. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Labor.